So I am so, I mean, I'm so excited to have you. I think everybody knows around my block and down the street and everyone <laughs> I work with. I have Brian Kane, who is, in my opinion, one of the best mental performance coaches out there because he actually explains, you actually explain the practicality of how to implement things as opposed to just theory. Sure. So thank you so much. He flew in just to do this podcast and I'm, I am just beyond appreciative over that. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, like I said, my pleasure. Um, let's start with the basics. Can you tell, can you kind of explain what mental performance coaching is in sure. layman's terms? Absolutely. Right. So probably to understand what mental performance coaching is, it's probably easier to start with what it is not. So to do that, <laughs> let's bring out a couple props, right? right. So if you I think about props. like the field of mental performance coaching, which a lot of people now might use the term mental conditioning coach, mm -hmm. peak performance coach, mental skills coordinator, sports psychologist, applied sports psychologist. So how is that similar but different than mental performance coaching? Okay, let me give you an example. So if, when you go to school to become a mental performance coach, you go into a applied sports psychology program. However, when you get into sports psychology, think about three domains, right? Three areas. There's what we'd call clinical sports psychology, which is going to be your straight clinical psych work. So drug, alcohol, addiction, body image, uh, dealing with depression, those sort of issues. Okay. That's not mental performance coaching. That's clinical sports psychology. If you're working with athletes, clinical psychology, if you're working with non-athletes, okay. then you have research sports psychology, which is your classic academic, like well, let's take three people that have never shot free throws before. And you're going to visualize 10 free throws for a week. And Person B is going to visualize five and shoot five, and person C, C is going to shoot 10, and then at the end, we'll test and see. Okay, great. What does that prove? Imagery works. Okay. Now what, right? right? How do I use it? How do I go from theory to application? And that's what mental performance coaching is, is it's taking, the, taking what's like talked about in research and making it practical for the everyday person. Right. So saying you, you know, have to use mental imagery and then as an athlete saying, okay, well, as a tennis player, you know, before you serve the ball, when you're dribbling the ball and then you get ready to serve and hit it over the net, visualize the serve that you want to hit before you walk in to do a presentation or you walk in to close a deal as someone who's working in sales, visualize the entire process of it going good, it going bad, and how you're going to manage that situation as you walk in as a UFC fighter. Visualize yourself not just getting the knockout, but walking in the cage and the environment and the energy and everything that that's going to feel like as you're walking in there. So what we try to do as mental performance coaches is take what's talked about in research, but actually put it into action in everyday life with performers. So I should say, I mean, you work a lot. I mean, for people who don't know you, you work a ton with top athletes. That's really your, like, that's really the, your bread and butter, so to speak, right? With people who are already very high achieving and who have a lot of, uh, who, who are certainly disciplined and then you take it to the next level, right? And you're not well, always disciplined. It's very talented. Okay. It's very talented. Sure. Very talented. I, I not say, always disciplined trying to grow who, that. Yeah. I should say that people who are very talented, but then need to get their mental, their brains focused and, and disciplined. Yeah. And there's a lot, there's, you've got 10 pillars, yeah. which, which is what I was going to say. So Brian breaks this down in a really easy way. He has 10 pillars and why don't we kind of touch on each one mm -hmm. so uh, we can understand how we can better improve. For sure. And as we go through the 10 pillars, as pe the, your audience will probably go, oh, I, I do that already, right? But do they do it to the best ability? Do right. They do it as well as they can. Like, so if you, look, if you look at the 10 pillars, the first pillar is, is what we would call elite mindset. And do you have a growth or do you have a fixed mindset? You know, are you somebody that allows your feelings to dictate your actions or are you someone who's going to understand that your actions will change your feelings? And which one do you focus on? That's just kind of the tip of the iceberg of, of elite mindset. Right. The second pillar would be motivation and commitment. Do you, know, do you understand what it is you're after? Do you have clarity of what you want and why you want it and then have a path to be able to get there? And do you have the motivation and commitment deep enough to be able to handle the adversity and the grind and everything that's going to come to try to knock you off your path? And then step the, pillar three is the, is the focus and awareness, right? Do you have the focus and awareness to know when you're on task and what the things are that knock you off task? Mm -hmm. Because probably the greatest way to achieve any goal is simply time on task. Mm -hmm. And can you stay focused in the moment and after what you want? Pillar four is going to be self-control and discipline because just because you know what you want and you have the motivation and commitment to get there, do you have the self-control and discipline to do it consistently? And from a fitness standpoint, 
you know, do you have the self-control and discipline to make the right decisions nutritionally? Because as you know, you can't outwork poor nutrition. Right. Right. Cannot. Pillar five is going to be the ability to keep the process over the outcome. Everybody wants to talk about outcomes. Motivational speakers will talk about keeping your eyes on the prize. Well, if you're looking at the prize, you're going to miss the step that you need to take next to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. So when we talk about process over outcome, if you think about another visual of a, of a staircase, everyone wants to look at the top step. But what they don't want to do is simply take the next one. And if you can take a staircase and sort of reverse engineer down mm -hmm. into what's the next logical step for me to take, that's what the process is, is that staircase that you have to climb to get to the outcome that you want. So when we talk process over outcome, another simple way to think about it is having a telescope goal, seeing into the future, where do I want to go? But then bringing that back to a microscope goal of how am I going to attack the next 24 hours that I have to get me just a little bit closer to where I want to go. So that process over outcome approach is, is pillar number five. Pillar number six is going to be meditation and mental imagery. Meditation being, am I able to quiet my mind and, and stay in the present? Am I able to you know, turn on the recovery switch, activate the parasympathetic you know, nervous system? Mm -hmm and mental imagery as a tool to be able to visualize myself performing the way I want to for increased preparation and increased confidence, right? This whole mentality that if you can see it and you can believe it, you can achieve it, like bullshit. You have to do a lot of the work, right? You can sit around and you can visualize all the, the best body that you want to have. You can visualize writing a book. You can visualize doing all this great stuff, but if you don't put it into action on a daily basis, you're just daydreaming, right? You know, it's not going to help you get where you want to go. But if you have the work ethic and you have the, 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 the understanding of the process and the, what it's going to take from a motivation and commitment standpoint and a focus and awareness standpoint, and you're doing the work on a daily basis, mental imagery can help you to get over that hump mm -hmm. and help you to have increased confidence and preparation. Pillar seven is routines and habits of excellence, which I'm excited to talk about here because, <laughs> because we know we become what we do on a daily basis. Right. And, Absolutely. And, a great quote that comes out of Jim Collins' book, you know, Good to Great, mm -hmm. is that if you want to be consistent over time, you have to be able to describe what you do as a process. And you know, process is very similar to habits and what you do, what you do daily. And you have to inject that hustle in with your habits, or it's just not, it's not going to happen for you. So right. that's what I love about being on your podcast is I think that you've nailed the nail on the head with habits and hustle. You got to have a balance of both for sure. Thank you. Pillar eight is going to be time management and organization. Because you can have great goals, but if you can't manage your time, you're going to get beat by the person who can. Because time is yeah. the great equalizer of all people because there's 86,400 seconds in a day and 168 hours in a week. And you have the same amount of time that I do. So if you're better with your time than I am, over the course of time, you will, get, you will separate yourself from where I'm at. Right. And then pillar number nine is leadership. And pillar number 10 is creating the right culture and surrounding yourself in the right environment of excellence to help you get to where you want to go. Wow. And so... What you So basically, when you work with your clients and these athletes, and also you work with a lot of like high prof like CEOs and very like high like very high profile executives, mm -hmm. I would imagine, mm -hmm. um, do you go through these ten pillars, and what do you do with them to kind of get all ten pillars looked after? Like how do they how do they hone in on each pillar and get good at it and can keep it consistent and and work the program? I mean, to get started, they're doing it already. Right. I mean, everyone, who, every, everyone who's watching this video or listening to this podcast right now it has heard of the 10 pillars. They just haven't put, heard of it maybe in that framework. Right. Like if you say focus and awareness, they go, oh, yeah, okay, I, I would like to be able to focus better. Yeah, I'd like to have better self-control and discipline. Yeah, I'd like to be a better leader. I'd like to be better with time management. So all of those are what I would call like skill sets. Think about mental performance mastery or mental toughness, whatever right. you want to call it. Right. Just call it mental performance mastery. That's a skill. And that skill is made up of 10 skill sets. The skill sets being elite mindset, motivation and commitment, focus and awareness, what we just covered. And is every, in your opinion, mm -hmm. okay, do you feel like anybody can master those 10 if they are disciplined and they have the work? Like, so if someone is like, if someone, like you said, you said it perfectly, you can, a lot of people are like, yeah, I want to do that. Yeah, I want to be a better leader. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to lose 20 pounds. Yeah, mm -hmm. I want to be more focused. Mm -hmm. But yet, like the, from game from A to B doesn't really they're not doing it, right? Can you train your brain to actually become better at those things? 100%. They're all trainable skills, right? There's, there, there's skills that some people have and some people don't, but they're all trainable skills. One of the pillars is not, you have to be six foot five. You can't train that. But how do you train, if you're, if, so if you're, not, if you're not somebody who's disciplined, mm -hmm. how do you become more disciplined? 
start, in your opinion? Start, start with one thing that you don't want to do every day that will help you to develop the skill of discipline. It's very, if you've probably seen the talk that Admiral William McRaven gave at the University of Texas, the commencement speech, where he said, you know, there's 10 ways to change the world, but you have to start with yourself. Mm -hmm. And he gave 10 SEAL team principles right. that will help the graduating students from the University of Texas to change the world. You know what the first thing he said was? Make your bed. Yeah, that's a bit. That's that's been like a big. This is a very popular thing right now. Making your bed is the first thing, right? Yeah, because it's the, it's when when that alarm clock goes off and you get up mm -hmm. and you have the decision to make, because ultimately it's your decisions that are going to determine your destiny. Yeah, is you have the decision to make. Do I make my bed? And when you make your bed, one, you're acting different than how you feel, which is a which is a skill of all great performers because yeah. you don't feel like doing it every day. That's just, right. Just do it anyway. Right, feeling has very little to do with it once you make the commitment to decide that feeling has very little to do with it. Yeah. So you, you act different than how you feel, you pay attention to detail, and you exercise self control and discipline over yourself. And that little voice inside your head that goes, Yeah, I don't need to make the bed today, you tell it to fuck off and you make the bed anyway. <laughs> I love that. I also read that even when you, you travel and you're in hotel rooms, you still make the bed. In my bed, yeah, I made it, made it this morning. Yeah. You know, and it's in a city and you make it, and sometimes you start laughing, but it's like, I, uh, well, I don't want to break the street. Right. You don't want to break the, ri yeah. the ritual. And, and, and I know from experience, having done it now for a number of years, is that if I don't make my bed, something's off. And, right. I'm, and I'm not making my bed because maybe I'm overtired and I'm sleeping to the last minute, or I'm not making my bed because I get up and I get out of my morning routine where as soon as I pick up my cell phone, it's like the battle is on, right? Yep, so I agree. my mentality is I, I got to sweat before screens. So when I'm rocking really well, oh, we're going to get to that. Yeah, it's up. It's make the bed and get moving. But if I don't make the bed, I know something is off. And if something is off, it's like the, it's like the airplane that leaves San Diego flying to New York, right? Yeah. If the tip of that nose is one degree off, you're landing in Albany or you're landing in Philadelphia. You're not hitting your goal in New York City. Yeah. But you'll never know if that's one degree off until you get to your destination. Absolutely. I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. Like I, I, I've been doing the same morning ritual for like 20 years and I can never steer away, even it, the most, but to, it, 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 to the minutia of it, like the glass of water I drink has to have, it has to be here, it has to be room temperature, it can't be that. But those things keep you on point, Yeah. which is a great segue into you. I, this guy, I'm telling you, I have never seen a more scheduled human in my <laughs> life. I actually put your schedule, yeah, your I daily schedule yeah, on my that. IG yeah. story because yeah. it was unbelievable. I've never seen it. It is your day is scheduled to the minute every single day at five o'clock to five thirty, five thirty to five forty-five, six o'clock to six thirty. You are so regimented, which is what you need to do to be successful and to get goals and to achieve your goals. Mm -hmm. So, like your morning routine is, we were going to say, you go ahead. Tell me what your morning routine is. Yeah. So the morning routine for me changes based off of like the the. I call it the season, right? So but it, it's pretty. It, the things that are going to be consistent, right? And I always start with the PM routine because a great PM routine leads you into the great AM routine. If you focus on the AM routine, but your PM routine is off, if your PM routine is off, your AM is probably going to be off. I love that. So that's a good. That's a very good point. Have a good night routine, yeah. In addition to a good morning routine, yes. because they they both work with each other. They're for sure. Yeah. You can't you can't really have one without the other. You okay. know. So it, it's very most simple form my evening routine, whether I'm home, if I'm home and I have a week where I'm going to be home, which hardly ever happens. But if it's that, if that's the case, I'll maybe add some more things into the PM routine. But at the very basic level, when I'm 280 days a year on the road and maybe not more than three days in a certain city and I'm all over the place, my PM routine is going to be lay out my clothes for what I'm going to wear tomorrow. Take my PM supplement routine, my supplements. What do you take? Uh, I'll take a uh, Thorn Elite PM. I'll take a... A, a what? Thor Thorn is the company. It's called oh. Elite, Elite PM. Is okay. there is there uh, vitamins? I'll take. Uh, what's in it? Uh oh, I stumped you. What's, I stumped what's, Ryan. What's in it? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll pull up the bottle on your phone. I don't have to study it because it's right oh, there. Okay. I don't know how many feet in a mile either. I'll just ask. Okay. <laughs> I'll just ask <laughs> but okay. I'll so fair enough. I, I trust. I trust my coach, and, and my coach okay. would say, you know, this, this is what you want to take for a nighttime supplement routine. Okay. So it's Thorn Elite PM. It's a, it's a uh, CBD from Thorn, a hemp oil. And it's uh, a zinc magnesium from ZMA. So I'll take that. And then if, depending on where I'm at, time zone wise, I might take a milligram of melatonin. Try not to, but if I feel like I, I need it to fall asleep, I'll do that, uh, which is not often, maybe once a week. So, so I'll do that. I'll go lay out the clothes, uh, supplements, and then I will put my phone on airplane mode and plug it in where I cannot reach it 
from my bed. If I can reach my phone from my bed, I'm going to be on it all night because right. it's too tempting. So I'll plug it in somewhere where I can't reach it, right? And that's it. That's the basic. And then I go into bed, earplugs in, eye mask, and I'm out. And then when I wake up, what time, in the morning, you, what time are you going to bed? Oh, it, it depends. And the, and I can show you in my ideal day. My ideal day is nine thirty to five thirty. You know, in the ideal, like, mm-hmm. it, and I have it written down. I actually shared it with you in, in preparation I for this. S- I sent you an email. It says, "Here's the ideal day." Because I think if you don't know what your ideal day looks like, you're never going to achieve it. Right. So I have written down, here's what my ideal day looks like. I just don't get those unless I'm home and I control my schedule. Right. And when you work in mental performance and your your mission is serving and educating, empowering other people, other people kind of dictate your schedule. Right. I don't have that luxury to be able to create my own schedule most days. So the morning routine is wake up. Um, you know, usually first thing I'm doing is going to the bathroom and then I'm, and then <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to take my morning supplements and then I'm going to uh, get dressed and then I'm going to make the bed and then I'm out the door working out, trying to sweat before screens. Sweat before screens means if I don't work out before I get in front of the computer, before I open up my cell phone, it's probably not going to happen because right. I love what I do. And as soon as someone says, hey, they have a question, like, and I see it, I'm going to answer it. And the next thing you know, Pandora's box is open and all hell breaks loose and Absolutely. you're probably not getting into it. So what I've learned over the course of time and going from 240 pounds to 190 pounds based off of habits and hustle mm-hmm. is that if I don't take care of myself first, I'm not worth anything for anybody. Right. So I got to take care of my stuff first. So, but the AM and PM routines, if I have more time in the morning, depending on what time I'm getting up, I'll read Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic. I'll go through a calm daily meditation. Okay, wait. So what does it tell? What's Daily Stoic? It's basically because that's very popular right now. Yeah, too. yeah. So, so Daily Stoic is a is a one page a day daily reader. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've gone through uh, like I wrote a daily reader, the Daily Dominator. I've gone through John Maxwell's Maxwell Daily Reader. And I'm a big fan of just short and sweet and, and, and to the point with a little bit of inspiration and information like right out of the shoot when you wake up in the morning. And Ryan Holiday's Daily Stoic, to me, uh, Stoicism, and the tattoo I have is an example of Stoicism, right. is stop looking outside for answers and start looking inside for answers. And Stoicism is that the only meaning there is in life is the meaning that you choose to give to a situation. That's so why two people can be in the exact same situation and they respond completely different. It's because of the meaning that they attach to that situation. So every day, uh, what Ryan does, he writes, you know, a page or two and he'll have, have a quote from, you know, Marcus Aurelius or one, Plato or one of your mm-hmm. old Stoics. And then Ryan will take that quote and he'll make it apply to every day, like life of what's happening here in the 21st century. It's fascinating. No, I know. Eric, we have a mutual friend, yeah. Eric Burns, yeah. also does that. Yeah. And that's why, I mean, did you get it from him? Did he get it from you? Mm. Or were you both just doing it just by... By coincidence. Yeah, I think it was, I think it was more coincidence. Um, but I know he's a big. He's every every day he's daily daily stoic, and every day he's calm. You yeah. know, and, he, and actually is it we're calm? Kind of, calm the calm app. Oh, the the calm, calm, calm is okay, a I'm meditation like, uh... app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's the opposite <laughs> yeah, of calm. But I don't think he's calm. the uh, the calm daily meditation app. And what's cool it, what's cool with Eric is that every morning when he does it, he'll like send me a text that he's done it. So there's an accountability partner. Yeah. There to that you know, which is so. super important. Having an totally. account, having an accountability partner or having something you're accountable to really helps with people's goals as well. So 100% have to I have to. And even so, so how did you become so like vigilant like that and read like kind of like so structured? Did you, were you always just like that? Like how did you even become a <laughs> performance coach? Like just wasn't your background, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, two different questions there. How did I, I know, become sorry. so structured? Let's go to that first. How did I become so structured? I had to get shit done. Yeah. And I wanted, and I was working as a high school health and phys ed teacher in Vermont and, wow. How many years ago was this? Uh, this was 2003, four, four school year. Wow. So I get out of grad school, which we'll go back to when, you know, when I got, how did you get into mental performance coaching? But I'm teaching high school health and phys ed in Vermont and loved it. And then an opportunity came up to be a high school athletic director. So I took, so I applied and I was at the time, I think the only person that applied that had a master's degree. So I kind of got it by default, you right. know, but, <laughs> and not, but then I really enjoyed the, the athletic director's job too. It was like 85% of the time. I loved it. And I was doing mental performance coaching on the side because when I got started, it was, it was at, I'll, I'll go back. I remember the clear, clear as day. You know, I'm a college baseball player, University of Vermont, struggling in athletics, failing for the first time, growing up in a small town in Massachusetts. You know, you never really fail, right? And then you go to Division One college baseball. Everyone is, is equally as talented right. and you struggle and you fail. And you think that the method for dealing with failure is work harder. But if you work harder at the wrong thing, all you do is get further from where you want to be faster. 
So I'm thinking, okay, I got to, I got to get in better shape. I get up and I'm running five, six miles every morning in Vermont when it's negative 30 degrees before practice. And our practice was at like six o'clock in the morning indoors. And my fastball goes from 88 to 82. Well, you know, the difference between fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fiber Mm -hmm. and baseball is a fast twitch sport. And I was training slow twitch. So I was getting worse faster and it drove me fucking crazy. Yeah. So someone said, Hey, you got to go work with our sports psychologist on campus. So I started to meet with her. It was, it was helpful, but it was fascinating. And I'm like, wow. So, so, so there's a mental component to, to all, everything that we do. And you're trying to coach me on this mental component. Great. And then I remember it clear as day, July 4th, 2000 Commonwealth Ave, Boston, Massachusetts. There's a Barnes and Noble on the campus of Boston university. I was down there with a friend of mine from Alaska who we were down there for July 4th. And he wanted to send a postcard back to his mother in Alaska. So we walk into Barnes and Noble. First time I've ever been into a bookstore and it's kind of near Fenway Park. So they have a baseball section. So I walk over to the baseball section and I see a book heads up baseball playing one pitch at a time. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Take it off the shelf. And the author, Ken Revisa, who lived maybe 15 minutes from here in Redondo Beach, had taken in that book and he wrote in like black boxes around the main points in the book. So if you flip through, you could go through the entire book, Cliff Notes, by reading the, mm-hmm. the black boxes in like 20 minutes. And I'm reading this book, Jen, and it's speaking to me like I've never heard any coach in an entire 21 years of athletics ever talk about. Control what you can control. Focus on being in control of yourself before you can control your performance because you have you have to be in control of yourself before you can control your performance. Mm-hmm. You have very little control of what goes on around you, total control of how you choose to respond to it. It was like stoicism for baseball. Have a routine to be consistent. Focus on the process, not the outcome. If you want to get drafted or, or play mm-hmm. professionally, then focus on executing what you're doing today. Never heard someone talk about that. So I bought the book, read the book cover to cover, driving back to Vermont. I made the kid from Alaska drive. I go to the library at the University of Vermont where I'm a phys ed major because I don't own a computer. And I send them an email and just said, hey, man, loved your book. Really good. I want to be a college baseball coach. How do I get more of this? Three weeks later, I get a handwritten letter that says, hey, I'm from Connecticut. I'm a professor at Cal State Fullerton. We have a really good college baseball team here. If you come and you study sports psychology, you'll learn what's in Heads Up Baseball, and I probably could get you to work with our Fullerton baseball team. Sign me up. So I go out to Fullerton in 2002 and three, We're the number one team in the country all year in 2003, go to the College World Series and, and lose, finish, set, finish third. 2004, they're 15 and 16. Worst start ever at Cal State Fullerton. And they go like 36 and four the rest of the way and win the national championship. And then the pitching coach got the job at UC Irvine. And he called me and said, hey, would you come and work with us? We don't have a budget. I can pay for your expenses, but we can't pay you to come out here and work. I said, fuck, I'll be there tomorrow. Sign me up. I'm in. So I start flying to, to, to UC Irvine, and we get it going. It's my first kind of team, and I'm working with the pitching coach who I was with the last two years at Cal State Fullerton. And then that summer, he's on the Team USA staff with the head coach from Vanderbilt and the head coach from TCU. So I naturally, I pick up Vanderbilt and TCU because those three coaches, it's all word of mouth, mm. and this is helping our program. Right. And at the time, at TCU is a pitcher named Jay Carrietta, who wins the Cy Young for the Chicago Cubs in 2015 as the best pitcher in baseball. And there's a pitcher at Vanderbilt named David Price, who wins the Cy Young with the Tampa Bay Rays and just won the World Series with the Boston Red Sox this past year. And at the same time, it's about 2007, I'm teaching a sports psychology class at the University of Vermont. And one of my students is a strength coach who trains a UFC fighter named Tom Murphy. I'm like, there's a UFC fighter in Vermont? I want to, can I meet this guy? He trains in Montreal with George St. Pierre. Oh. So I start going to Montreal with Tom. And George at the time wins the title and then loses the title. And then Tom gets me connected with George. And then from there, it was like the compound effect. And just you go from three teams to six teams, from one fighter to wow. four fighters. Next thing you know... I've got to make a decision between do I want to continue to be a high school athletic director or try to go pursue this mental performance coaching thing full time? Because I was doing two full time jobs. Right. And that's where the schedule came from is how can I be a, how can I be a high school athletic director working like 70 to 80 hours a week hmm. and be a mental performance coach at the same time? And you're also like, no joke, you're not working, you're working with like the highest level of an athlete. Like George St. Pierre is the most recognizable, biggest champion ever in UFC. Mm hmm. And you've been his mental performance coach for, for years now. Yeah, we started in May of 07, right after he, or uh, August of 07, like right after he lost to Matt Sarah. I mean, the last time he lost a fight. That's like, that's massive. So for people who don't know who that guy is, Google it because that just right there says a lot. So 
then you become a mental performance that then you become a mental performance coach full time. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're because your schedule is so kooky between that and your other job, you had to become you had to train yourself really to be super regimented and have a big have structure. Yeah. But yeah, and and I and I'll tell you that it, you know August 2nd, 2010, my mother passed away of lung cancer. And and oh. the school district I was in gave me a, I said, Hey, can I, can I get a sabbatical? There's some things I need to take care of back home. And they gave me a sabbatical. So I had a year off, right. Of no pay. And then I would get my job back. There's only five full-time athletic directors jobs in Vermont. And I loved it. Loved it. But then I went on the road for like 90 straight days to try to build up some income mm -hmm. from the mental performance side of things to replace what I was losing for that year. Right. And I'm like, yeah, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret this my whole life. But now is the time. No kids, not married, like, let's go get it. And that's when the 208 days a year on the road started. And um, <clears throat> I haven't turned back since, you know. And, and you wow. make decisions, right? You make decisions, not sacrifices. Like, that's one of the things I learned from George. And I think when you do mental performance coaching, the cool part about it is you're around these really successful people that are looking for, like, that 1% edge. They're already at the top. That's what I was going to say, yeah. yeah. They're already at the top, but they want to stay at the top, right? Because it's, it's harder to stay there than to get there. Absolutely. So when so when they get there, they want to stay there, and they're looking for any edge they can get. And you know, one of the things he said is he said, you know, one of the biggest differences that the mental performance has made for me is I'm not making sacrifices to be great. I'm not making a sacrifice to be a world champion. It's a decision I'm making. Right. And the decisions that I make every day have to align with my goal of being not a UFC world champion, being the greatest mixed martial artist of all time, because being a UFC champion has a finish line. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that finish line, which he did when he beat Matt Sarah and won the title, it was like, well, well, now what? Right. And then when he set the goal to be, I want to be the greatest mixed martial artist of all time, process goal, no finish line, then every single day you have to make decisions in line with that. And, and he did that better than maybe any athlete I've ever worked with. Wow. Yeah. How did, so what, did, what was that one, when you worked on that 1%, <clears throat> what was your methodology? Besides, of course, like how do you train someone who's so good, not just talent, but also has that discipline and everything else we talked about? How did you, what, what was that little like extra thing that you yeah. did? Um, <laughs> it's not, it's like, if you look at the 10 pillars, right? It's for sometimes it's, it's 10% growth in one area. Most of the time, if they're already elite and mm -hmm. at the highest level, it's 1% growth in 10 areas. Mm -hmm. It's not one thing. It's a little bit of everything. So one of your questions earlier was like, well, where do you, where do you kind of get started when I'm working with CEOs or, or you know, SEC football coaches or major league baseball managers or nine-year-old little league athletes or, you know, 19-year major league right, baseball right, veterans right. like Raul Banyas. Where do you get started? Right. You say, here's the 10 pillars. Where do you feel like you're at in each of these areas? And then they give themselves like a... Like a, 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 like a self... Yeah, like a self-evaluation, a score right. of one to 10, where I feel like I'm at. Just like you would do as a fitness professional when you sit down with a one-on-one -on -one client and say, tell me about your fitness goals. How do you feel like you are with nutrition? How do you feel like you are with energy? How are you doing with sleep? You're doing kind of a, an assessment of where they're at. And then you say, okay, well, which of these areas do we want to go after first? And then, okay, well, what are you doing to grow your time management and organization? What are you doing right now to train your focus and awareness? What are you doing right now to train your self-control right. and discipline? How are you training, you know, your leadership skills if you need them? And one, pillars one through eight are really like everyone needs. Not everyone needs leadership skill. Right. No, I was going to you know say. But with someone like that, right, who yep. is already doing what you like that is that that one percent so little so like let's say what where is the difference in the focus and awareness or the self-discipline with someone like him mm -hmm. george st pierre mm -hmm. where was it like how did you try what what did you have to do to get to that next one percent listen listen <laughs> ask ask questions ask the right the right ask questions. the right questions listen and then what give work does he have to do give strategy he has to he has to take the strategies that we Decide this is what we want you to do, the game plan. Yeah. And then put it into action on a consistent basis. Because it will work. Mental performance coaching will work for anybody if they're willing to work it. Right. Right. Everyone, anyone listening to this, will better, their life will improve and benefit if they get a stronger mindset. Right. If they have better focus and awareness. And there's ways to train all those skills. They just have to do it. Right. So, for example, um, talking around mindset. Okay, one of the things, one of the things that every UFC fighter, and I've had a chance to corner five guys that have been UFC world champions, George being one of them, is they would say to me, Man, I want to, I want to not be so nervous walking to the cage. Mm. I wanna I wanna eliminate all self-doubt in the 
in the locker room. I want to be fearless. And I would say to him, well, I'm sorry, you're fucked. That's not going to happen. And they look at me like, what? Pattern interrupt, right? Uh, uh, and and I probably should have asked if I could speak freely on your podcast. You can. But, go okay. ahead. Too late now. <laughs> yeah, too late, too late now unless Whoops. we got some good editing. Right? Yeah, nope, no editing here. And I do have here. a youth audience at home, so make sure we, we put the explicit <laughs> tag on here. But um, You're good. Trust I say, you know, you, you, guys, you guys are in trouble. You, you, you're not, that's not going to happen. And they look at you and like, what do you mean? You, you helped other fighters to do that. And I said, no, the difference between being fearless and being courageous is fearless is fear doesn't exist. Courageous is you face the fear and say, I'm going to go anyway. And being courageous is a lot different than being fearless. Fearless, I don't think exists. Courageous is what people need. And when they go, oh, you mean I don't have to, I don't have to try to eliminate this feeling of fear? No, you have to use it as fuel. Fear means you're set up to do something big. Fear means you're probably in the right place about to do something that is meaningful to you and you don't want to perform. You, know, you want to perform at a level where you're, going to, where you're going to succeed. Great. So let's take that fear and let's harness it and use it the right way. And part of that is the research that Amy Cuddy has done with her book Presence mm, coming yeah. out of Harvard is, is, you know, fake it till you make it is really fake it till you find it, right? And the difference between power posing and how you, when you right. act big, you carry your, you increase cortisol, and you decrease stress, the whole thing. Absolutely. So one of the applied things that we would do to help them to manage the fear and use it for fuel is we would practice how they're going to walk to the cage. So the morning of the fight, they're fighting at 10 o'clock at night in Vegas at 10 a.m. We're in the locker room, very light warm up, but now we're practicing walking from the locker room down the tunnel, out to the cage, getting up in the octagon, going through what they're going to do from a routine standpoint and putting and practicing the state that they want to get into. And all states are made up of three things, your body language, your focus, your self-talk. So the body language is the easiest one to correct because you can see it as a coach. Right. right, and we can videotape it. We can go back and literally break down. Here's how you're walking into the cage. So wait, you said body language, focus, and self, self focus yeah. and self talk are the three things that what create your states. Okay, create your states. Create your states. So okay. like, so like when someone walks into a room, right? If we were to go, if we were to go sit in a in a bar, or we were to go sit in a uh, athletic arena, right, mm -hmm. and watch people come walking in, you can tell a lot about someone's state simply by the way they carry themselves. Absolutely agree with that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you, you as, as a fitness professional, when you're <laughs> love doing, how you keep on calling me a fitness, fitness professional. professional, right? When you're, when you're doing your, your personal training, right? As a coach and someone comes walking in, you know exactly where they're at just by the way they're walking into the gym. Mm -hmm. Are they walking in with a smile with a little bit of juice and energy or are they walking in with their head down? We're missing and I'm happy. Yeah. yeah. And you're so you're, okay, well, but if we're going to get a workout in today, I'm going to have to help get their mind right. And then having something to go to, to be able to do that. Right. Right, so practicing walking into the cage was part of the body language. The focus piece was simplifying the game plan to say, like, what are your performance ABCs? And we'll use an MMA example, but this can apply to anything. Performance ABCs would be, what are the three things that you have to do today? I shouldn't say have to, turn have to into want to. Mm -hmm. What are the three things you want to do today that will give you a best chance to win? I got to circle off of my jab. I have to push the pace of the fight and keep it high tempo because I have better conditioning and I have to take my opponent down. So A, circle off my jab. B, push the pace of the fight. C, take my opponent down. Bring it to the ground. So like even when I'm doing mental performance coaching and I'm going into, uh, say, work with Marquette men's basketball, I'll set my ABCs. A, have great energy. B, you know, talk to guys about body language. C, be really engaged when I'm there, which means like leave my phone mm -hmm. in the car. Don't even bring it into the facility with me. So I have a simple game plan going in. And then at the end of the day, I'll look back and go, how did I do it executing those ABCs? And if I executed those ABCs, my focus was probably pretty good. Thus, my performance was probably pretty good mm -hmm. because your focus is going to determine your future. And then self-talk, one of the ways we would train self-talk is I'd say, uh, to, to, we'll use George as an example. I'd say, George, tell me about like the road, like road, road work, right? How much running are you going to do in terms of just cardio? And some guys it's on a bike, some guys it's running. And say, so, well, I do, uh, you know, 20 minutes a day or whatever. I'd say, okay, good. What do you listen to? I listen to music or I listen to nothing. That's all right. Give me, give me 10 minutes of that time. Mm. Now I would make an audio with usually like instrumental music in the background. And I would say things that I want him to repeat to himself. So affirmations. Uh, exactly. So I call them confidence conditioning statements or affirmations. So, at, you're, so you're a big believer in affirmations as part of the... I'm a, I'm a, I'm a believer that you can train self-talk and have something to go to because I'm a believer that you don't rise to the occasion, you sink to your training and habits. And if you're not training self-talk, you're missing an opportunity to, to have 
specific self-talk that you want in performance. Okay, so, so I, yes, I, I think affirmations. You, you hesitated though when I said. Well, you, because I don't really like the word affirmations because I think that too many times there's motivational speakers or these you know self-help gurus that are like, I want you to read these affirmations about mm-hmm. I make ten million dollars a year and I do this and I do that and it's like that's just that's just like a piece of the puzzle. Right. That's not the whole thing. You know, right? So, what do you call it instead? I call them confidence conditioning statements, but essentially, it's affirmations, right? It's it's self talk. It's it's generating the self talk that you want intentionally and listening to it all the time, so that when you talk to yourself, that's what you say. So, like when when you're running, how many times will you go for a run and you start singing a song that you've listened to recently? I know to give to kind of pump me up, you know, to pump you yeah. up, right? Yeah, you're, you're singing a song over and over and over right? and over. I used to this. I still like. I've been listening to the same songs like for the last for, for years, yeah. and I, some songs, of course, you get bored of, but you do have your go to mm-hmm. that just kind of keep you pumped up and mm-hmm. make you feel confident, right? Yeah, and and you can probably dial up those songs without even having to, to hit your iPod. Right. You can do it in your own mind. Absolutely. Right? So one of the things that we would do is take take, for example, as a UFC fighter, they're going to walk to the cage to a song. Stop touching the table. Yeah, you're gonna. I'm gonna stop doing this. Yeah. <laughs> is this is this a problem? I try to tell them. Yes. Okay. Because you're gonna. All I want to hear is boom. Like. Yeah. Is it's it, doing great though. Is yeah. this better? Perfect. Thank you. Yes, that's it, way better. Is this awkward? Yeah, not awkward for me, <laughs> but. So when you're when you're um. Let me refocus here. Yeah. When we're talking <laughs> about you know self self talk and affirmation training, okay, I'll do it over here now. <laughs> Thank you. Right is is we would take a highlight video. So I'd take a highlight video of a fighter with getting takedowns and winning fights, whatever it is, and, and, and executing the way I want to execute. And I would put that highlight video to the song that they're going to walk to the cage to. Mm-hmm. And then I would take words of affirmation or confidence conditioning statements and I'd put them on the screen, the things they've been listening to in their audio. So when they watch that video, which mm-hmm. they would do every day for like six weeks leading up to the fight, and I would say, close your eyes, they close their eyes, listen to the video. I'd pause the video and say, what's on the screen? Oh, I just got to take down against so-and-so and I'm on top landing an elbow. So the image is now basically embedded in their mind. So when they go walking into the cage and they hear that song, what are the images that are going through their mind? Everything that they saw in the highlight right. video. So that it's almost like training them to have such a strong self-belief and confidence or a self-image in terms of being able to see themselves execute the way they want to. That when they hear that song, it just is like a trigger. If you understand habits and hustle, you understand the the habit loop, right? Trigger, routine, reward. That the trigger is when I hear that song, the routine is I see all these images in my mind of me performing the way I want to, Mm -hmm. which helps me with my body language, locks in my focus and my self-talk is that I'm I'm the the baddest dude out there and I'm going to go get it. Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. Okay. And then that sounds... Okay. I like that. That's obviously that does that does work because we all do it. Yeah, it works, especially in in the clientele like where professional athletes where I spend a lot of spaces. You have video of those guys, right? It, like my corporate clients, I don't actually have video of those guys. But <laughs> also, for, I, I know you don't normally have, but for a regular person, I think to yeah. to which to like visualize to a certain extent what you want what mm-hmm. you want to do what, for fitness. Like if you're trying to lose weight or mm-hmm. do something, it's good to visualize where you want to be, mm-hmm. but and then have a plan to work towards. But having like I think an affirmation, what you call. Like confidence that. conditioning statement. It's affirmations. It's the right. same thing. And they all work in, in tandem with other with other things. Mm-hmm. But I like what you said earlier uh, to me off offline about the staircase, right? Because it's more than just having a goal, but it's having those steps at the top of the. Well, you, I, I'm I'm not doing doing it justice. It's a process. It's, a saying, process. it's, it's having a process, a process to help you to get where you want to go. Right. Yeah. And then you you said them about confidence. Confidence is a choice. Mm. It's not. So isn't that kind of about faking it till you make it? Like you're choosing to be confident. You're choosing to kind of put yourself out there in a world where you have your where your body language when your when your when your presence is is confident and self assured. Doesn't that help get kind of like dictate your next like your 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 basically how you're presenting yourself is part of it to get to where you want to be in a certain way. Big part right? of it. Yeah. Big part of it. Because your physiology is going to affect your psychology. And your psychology will affect your physiology. It's like a two lane super highway between your body and your mind. So if you walk around like Eeyore, right? If I walk around and I <laughs> sit down like this, all of a sudden, how's my energy going to be? Right. Through the floor. How's my mindset going to be? Through the floor. How's my confidence going to be? Non existent. So people, and I, and I get this the, the conversation that I have the most probably with my clients, or at least at the beginning, is they're like, man, I just don't have confidence today. Like a major league baseball hitter, man, I just don't, I lost my confidence. You lost your confidence? Shit, let's look underneath this lemon. Maybe it's there, (laughs) you know? Maybe it's underneath that cup. You didn't lose your confidence. You're choosing to give it away. Confidence is a choice. 
Confidence is a state. What are states made up of? Body language, focus, and self-talk. Now, preparation can, will, will, will help you with your confidence. Like if you haven't done the work, and this is, where, this is where I think a lot of people can be confused by like the secret method, right? The secret method oh, of just yeah, you told me this. Sit, sit and visualize and it'll come true. No, you have to do a lot of the work. You, know, you, have to go, you have to go and invest in the preparation. Separation is in preparation. Who are you going to bet on? The person who's most prepared, mm -hmm. right? So, but if, you're, if both people are equally prepared, who then is going to win? Who's got more to go to? And I think what mental performance does is in under extreme stress, it gives you something to go to. And my friends that are you know, special operators or Navy SEALs that get into mental performance mastery and when, when they get out of the SEAL teams and- Well, and they're, 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 the, they're the baddest asses I've yeah, ever well, seen. Well, yeah. Right? And, the, and, the, and it's like, what's, what's similar between what I'm teaching these athletes and these, and these CEOs around mental performance mastery and that you did in the SEAL teams? And when they look at it, they're like, man, we did all this. And I had a friend of mine, Jason Kuhn, who was a former SEAL team operator and is now running a group called Stonewall Solutions, where he goes in and does education around mindset and leadership. Fascinating. You got to wow. get him as a guest, Jason Kuhn. Jason Kuhn. You know, yeah. I've heard of him before. He's like yeah. a well-known Navy SEAL yeah. dude. Yeah, he does a lot of speaking. And was it was it, we got connected because he was a former college baseball player. Really? Yeah, former college baseball player that uh, didn't, professional career didn't work out and he decided to go be a SEAL. How about that? And then, oh. and then his, 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 his roommate and buds, a guy named Sean Haggerty from... The selection uh, down in San Diego uh, has become a buddy of mine. But anyway, those guys have both said, they're like, look, what, what the reason why SEALs are able to do what they do mm -hmm. is six words. Relentless, fundamental execution under extreme stress. Yeah. And I think ultimately, if both people are as prepared and they go into a situation, an athletic situation, whether it be a fight, whether it be a pitcher-hitter confrontation, whether it be two people playing against each other in tennis, whatever it is, or two companies going to try to get the same deal, the same contract, who's going to have more skills to go to? Who's going to have more something to go to when this shit hits the fan under stress? Because it's going to hit the fan. Right. Do, mental, do Navy SEALs use mental performance coaches? They must. Yeah. I mean, I've not, you I've not myself been into, uh, you know, I've, I've been in the Coronado. I've never gone in and worked with SEALs in Coronado, but I know that they do have people that go in and do it. Well, for because sure. everything is mental. Like all the phys, I always say that the physical is the easy part, but if you get your mind right, if your mind right, the physical, it comes easily. Like it's changing your behaviors, changing the way you think, the way you focus, all these other things is what is the work. The other stuff is much easier to kind of that's like the byproduct after all. So that's why I would be surprised if they don't use people like you. I'm sure they, they should do. use you. Yeah, yeah. Talk to Jason Kuhn about yeah, getting yeah, you in yeah, there, yeah, I think. Yeah. You know? yeah, I'm sure they have they have, you know, they have um, they have mental skills training for sure. I was just speaking with a, a friend of mine as an athletic director at a university and assistant athletic director. He was a former Navy pilot for twenty years. And he talked about how the, and, we, and he was going, he's going through the mental performance mastery certification. And so where the conversation right, started was like, was like, what, what are, what did you use in the Navy as a fighter pilot on combat missions overseas that was in mental performance mastery? And he's like, all of it. He goes, be, you know, when you're, when you're an eight hour mission and 25 minutes into the mission, one of your, one of your co-pilots, you know, one, one of your planes that's up there flying with you gets blown up by a missile and you've got another seven and a half hours to fly that mission. How do you compartmentalize that loss and be able to still go and fight and execute and do what you have to do? So one of the skills that I don't I don't talk about a ton in the in the in the book or in the certification program, compartmentalization is like yeah. everyone's got shit. The difference between a professional and an amateur is the professional can have all this chaos going on around them and when it's time to go, they're still able to go and be clear. Right. And they're able to basically take everything that they have and go, you know what? This is not necessary for me to focus on right now. Let me throw it in a box. Let me put it over here and let me go take care of business. Yeah. And when business is done, I'll come back to this box and I'll address what's inside of it. Right. They can compartmentalize. separate compartmentalize for sure. Yeah. So like with, with, with people that wear a uniform, nurses, police officers, um, operators, athletes, it's like when you put the uniform on, you separate the who and the do. Mm -hmm. So when you're putting the uniform on, it's go time. And when the uniform comes off, like you, 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 you download, mm -hmm. you flip the switch down, you turn the intensity down and you go back and you be a, just a regular human being. Right. But when the uniform is on, you can't afford to be regular. Right. You can't have normal feelings. You can't have normal thoughts. Right. You have to be elite. And that's different than what's walking around on the streets every single day. Absolutely. Then how, like... You put together this great, I mean, I'm doing it as we speak, the mental performance mastery program, the 
it's like it's it's great and i'm not just saying that because you're sitting here it's because it really is like legit and great Appreciate it. and i don't think it's something that is only for people who are high achievers i think any like person normal person getting back to the norm could really benefit from it from the everyday life or like they get your mind right so how like that's like a, you did a lot of work on that and how did you like how long did how long did it take you to put that thing together let's see the guy's written 42 books, by the way, yeah, okay? Yeah. Uh, this is no joke, okay? The guy's written 42 books. So talk about someone who's an overachiever yeah. <clears throat> right over here. Yeah, yeah. You how, know? how long did it take me to put together the Mental Performance Mastery Certification? Yeah. Let's see. It came out when I was 40 and 40 in probably two months. So it probably took me 40 years and two months to put it together. It's probably, it's my life's work. It's, it's fantastic. You know, and I think it all started probably with like my high school football coach when I was a freshman in high school. The first guy who probably not intentionally just was what he was doing, started hanging up quotes in a locker room. It's not the size of the dog of the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. Some high school, some college football coach said that he right. wrote it down, put it up on the wall. I still remember that. I was a kid who was a freshman in high school. At the end of the year, when he was taking all those things down off the bulletin board and was going to throw them away, I said, hey, can I take that stuff? Really? And I hung it up in my room back home. And it was like the start of it, you know? Start of, the start of there's a mental component to it. Because I was never the biggest, the fastest, the strongest. Right. You know, so you had to have something to go to. And I think that thing to go to was, was mindset. And there was never any formal training on it. And what I've tried to do is like take it from the clouds, right? right. Take it from the clouds of, of mindset and leadership and make it more tangible and throw it in the dirt right. so we can play with it. You know, I was faking, I was faking, I was faking hit the table. I yeah. you were going to start touching <laughs> but, the table again. in the dirt so we can play with it. You know, throw it in the dirt so that we can like make it tangible so that we can grow. So anyone, anyone from, from I mean, some of the best Mental performance coaching sessions I've ever had are with like nine year old, nine and ten year olds. Yeah, what are you doing with a nine year old? Talking about routines and habits and consistency. Right at that age, because it starts young. Yeah. You want to you want to train their brain at a young age. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even a nine year old on a little league baseball team, there's an element of leadership because people are looking at them, people are looking up to them, and if if anyone is counting on you for anything, that's what quantifies you as a leader. Mm -hmm. So if you're nine years old and you have teammates that are counting on you, that makes you a leader. Right. And can they trust you? And if you think about trust as like a triangle, right? The right. trust triangle. If you have <laughs> trust as a triangle and there's three yeah. sides to it, like what is leadership? Essentially leadership, and Urban Meyer talks about this in his book, Above the Line, the right. former Ohio State Florida football coach, is he, he says that trust is two, or, or leadership is two things. It's building trust and it's getting results. Right? Leadership is influence where people are going to, you're going to be able to influence people and they're going to follow you. But they're not going to follow you if you don't get results. Right? And, and, right. and when I was 240 pounds and trying to be a mental performance coach, and it wasn't a good 240, and my, my mentor uh, at the University of Vermont, Declan Connolly, right, he's an exercise physiologist, mm -hmm. and he works with, with a ton of Olympic athletes and New York Rangers. Remember, I had him come out to the school that I was working at to speak to parents and to our coaches just about like, exercise physiology. He's like, well, oh, Mr. Kane, when I come up there, we'll go for a run. He's like, I hope you got your running shoes. I hope you're in shape. I'm training for this Ironman. We're going to go get a little bit of running. I'm like, oh, no problem. Let's do it. Couldn't run a mile. And he looks at me, he goes, Mr. Kane, leaders are not fat. Because if you want to have influence and impact over people and you want these high achievers and people to, to listen to the words that you're saying, they're never going to get past the fact that you're wearing a 44-inch waist right now. That's what he said to you. Yeah. And I was like, damn. And it was exactly what I needed to hear. And I've used that line many times with people. Leaders aren't fat. You want to know why your kids aren't performing for you? High school football coach? Because you're fat. They don't, they don't respect you. They're looking up to you right now. They're going, We're going to get in big to trouble for this right now. <laughs> but you know what? No one else is saying it, and it's true. And the people that I've said that to, and I know it's not probably politically correct. No, but, but say this is your opinion. But the, and this but is what the people feel, yeah. that I have shared that with, not all of them, because not everybody wants to hear the truth. But the people, when they hear that listening to this, and it hurts them, they probably hurt. It hurts because they know it. And it hurts because they know that they've allowed themselves to get in that situation. And, I, and that was me. And then you start making, okay, well, how did I get in this way? How did I get to this position? Well, I stopped taking care of myself because I was thinking I was taking care of everybody else. But really what I was doing is I'm giving the world my B game. No one wants your fucking B game. So take care of yourself. Get yourself into a better level of fitness. And with that comes a better level of focus because fitness and focus are tied together. Well, th th that's what I was going to say. 
that's what that's I think a very true point and I'm a big believer in that we had someone else on earlier today about that there's a major major connection between fitness and cognitive uh, totally. focus and, and, the, alert, and, then, and, and then performance and performance a hundred percent like what and we're we're examples of this when I work when I don't work out I am less productive less focused less alert period end of story that's it. Totally. And one works in one, they're interchangeable. You need one to get to be your highest level of productive, like productivity, focus, and having your cognitive functions working at a very primary level. It's true. hundred percent. And it's pr- proven with research. It's right? proven with research. It's That's, not just my opinion or your opinion. Yeah. This is actually proven. True. Yes. And they're taking phys ed out of schools across the country. Absolutely. Most schools don't even have phys ed right. anymore. Right. And, and no schools have, we're teaching mental performance. But what do you think you'd use more, Jen? What do you think? What do you think that, that I agree with you? What would Sydney use more? How to focus? How to have self control and discipline? How to create routines and habits? How to manage your time or Latin? No, I. You know listen, what I'm saying? But they teach Latin in school. You're but, preaching to the converted, yeah. and I think also, especially with um, technology, people are getting more and more lazy, which totally. is which is affecting their cognitive functioning ability because they're relying on just like. That, 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 like pressing a button, story case, pressing a button, that, 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 not moving, not, not, that there, there's a yeah. big thing between getting your blood circulating, having your brain working and moving. Mm-hmm. Also, when you exercise and move, you think usually while you're doing it, you get your best ideas totally. and best thoughts for that stuff. So totally. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. So I don't have to interrupt you. You have the floor. Go back. Where were we? Oh God. I, remember, I thought, you're, I thought I remember you were exactly alert and focused. We okay, I was. go. Okay. I was just kidding. <laughs> so, so he has that, he, he says that to me, right? And, yeah. then, and it, leaders aren't fat and politically correct or not, it's the truth in, in my experience. And when you say, when I've said that to people. We're not talking big bone people. We're no, not talking no. about, we're, to- we're not talking about people who are, you know, big, we're talking about people you're saying who have like a lot of subcutaneous fat. Yeah. We're talking, we're talking about, we're talking about the football coach who walks in and has got low energy Sits down, the guts hanging over the pants, right, we're not and he's sitting there with the chin falling down, and he's sitting there, and it, and he's like, "Well, our ki- my kids don't, my kids don't compete hard, blah blah blah." So I also think you lead by an. Ex- I think people lead by an example. Yes, people, I'm, yeah. especially if you're a leader, you lead by an example, and unfortunately, perception sometimes is reality. Right. Totally. It's you know, people always say to me, "Well, I want my trainer, my fitness, my personal trainer, to look really fit because." That's your model of what, yeah. right? Would you go to a doctor that smoked? Would right. you go to a poor financial planner? <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. People have to play a role yeah. and play a part to be successful at it. So I don't think this is meant to be insulting. It's meant to be like honest. It's meant to be alarming. Yeah. To say, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe he's talking to me. Maybe I, maybe I ought to start instead of taking the small decisions that are taking me away from where I want to mm-hmm. be, let me flip it by making small decisions to get to where I want to be. Right. And that small decision might be ditch the soda and get into water. A small decision might right. be instead of waiting to get the parking space as close to the front door as possible, as possible park as far away as you can. Right. So it's, just, it's small changes equal big wins. Totally. I excellence agree. in small things becomes excellence in all things. And it's, it's a continuum. What was that? What did you say? Excellence in small things becomes excellence in all things. Yeah. And it's like the energy cycle. I agree. Right? And if you're, if you, I call, call it bringing the juice, man. And if you're juiceful, you're useful. And if you're juiceless, you're pretty much useless to everybody else. <laughs> and the energy cycle is the more energy that you give to other people, the more energy you're going to have. The more energy you have, the more energy you have to give away. What does that mean? You have more energy. And it becomes a beautiful cycle. Yeah. But it goes the other way too. It goes the other way that if you don't have energy and you can't give energy to other people, you done, don't have any more energy to give because you're not getting a reloaded, right? So all of that goes in the wrong direction as well. Right. So it's, you know, and I'm, I don't mean to upset anybody. I don't mean to... No, but you're speaking your truth. It's, and it's my, I'm, I'm sharing my experience. And, and that one line for me changed my life. No, absolutely. And like I said, I believe that People have to lead by an example, not just in that with anything in life, they have to lead by an example. People, people, it's not just words, it's action. It's looking what you do and then me emulating what you do. Like why I'm a big fan and believer of you is because you walk the walk and you talk the talk. So it makes me much more motivated and inspired to do something, right? Like to, to live my life that way because I see what you're doing and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. If he can do it, I can do it. Amen. Right? Well, that's the thing. And it's like... It, I think with that, it's that way with anybody. Yeah, that's as what we, I think. And as we look at, it's why like leaders, leaders are readers, right? And as you read about other people and what they've achieved and what they do, you look at it and go, if they can do it, so can I. 
And a lot of times what you get from reading is you get from like, like looking at, you know, at, at, at strong as the new sexy, or you look at the different books that you, you mean that strong as new skinny because everybody can be strong. No, it's a I good would. goal, but not everyone can be skinny. He just said my, my, my book title wrong, everybody. It's really nice. Did I say strong as the new skinny? Because I meant, no, you I said, meant no. to say strong as the new sexy. Because no, if, it's because strong. If it, you just said it again. I yeah, think. I know. What I'm saying here, Jen, you're not listening. Uh-oh. You're not listening. So you're listening to respond instead of listening to understand. And what I said is it's strong as the new sexy. Do you want to be skinny or do you want to be sexy? I don't want to be skinny, but I'd love to be sexy. <laughs> so strong as the new sexy. You okay, would have sold I, a lot more books if that was your title. I know. Stop. I know. Next time. Maybe my, maybe my fourth book will be strong as the new sexy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll do that. Because, I mean, nobody wants to be skinny. Do you want to be skinny? Nope, no, that's my but point. you want to be sexy. You missed the point of, book, of the book title. Strong yeah. is the new skinny, which means, no. I, that's my whole point. Skinny is a goal that is sometimes very unattainable, and it's not, it means nothing. Everyone could be strong, which means mentally strong and physically yeah, yeah. strong. But people want to be sexy. Okay, so it should be called <laughs> sexy is the new skinny. <laughs> Strong, is, strong, the is, new, the strong is the new sex. Okay, strong is the new sex. Listen, yeah. we just drop this and go into onto badass body goals, my other book, which is much more relevant. No, I'm joking. Um, I'm telling you, my fourth book, I'll call it that. Awesome. Okay. Now, where were we about you and your life? Oh yeah, are you wearing all black at the Steve a Steve Jobs thing? Ah, uh, like- yes. As I was waiting to come on your show and I was looking through your library, I noticed that you had. It's the Steve Jobs autobiography. And one of the things that Steve Jobs talks about is you wore all black. And mm-hmm. the reason why is it's less decisions to make. So Absolutely. I converted to the all black. You know, and when you, I converted to all black because it's less decisions. What are you going to wear? Black. You know, so if I go buy a pair of black pants at Lululemon or whatever, I'll get the same like four pairs. You and, you and I, you know, great minds think alike. I'm a big believer in that too. I also think eating the same things every day, which yeah, I yeah. know is a, what you do. It's exactly what I did right. to go from 240 to, to 190 was it, eat the same thing every day. Absolutely. Eat for it eliminates not the taste. thought process. Yeah. And it opens up more mental energy to focus on other things that are more important. Like, what am I going to eat? I want to make that decision, set it and forget it and eat the same thing until I can't stomach it anymore and then try to find something else. Okay. So what do you eat every day? Well, it depends. You know, when I, when I, when I started back, when, when I got, uh, when, when I became aware that I was not living what I was teaching by mm-hmm. my mentor, Declan Connolly, thank you for saying that doc, if you're listening to this is I basically got on macro nutrition without even knowing it. Right. Okay. So very basic fitness is a cal- uh, three, 3,500 calories is like a pound. Okay. This mm-hmm. was, this was where my logic was. And I said, okay, 3,500 calories is a pound. And if I'm at a deficit of a thousand calories a day, then over the course of a week, give or take, maybe I'll lose a pound a week because I'm never going to exactly know how much calories I burned. And I'll probably never know exactly how many calories I brought in. And, but if I'm, if I'm trying to be at a deficit of a thousand a day, I'll try to lose a pound a week. So literally it was like, I'd have the same grapefruit and apple and carrots and a peanut butter jelly sandwich and two bananas and five hard boiled eggs and then whatever it was and a thing of almonds and that was it. And that's what I ate every single day. Is for your like name a Jennifer? Year. Maybe in a previous life. I was going to say, it sounds like me. A little yeah, bit. But, but now, you know, but now, now that I've gotten more educated, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the coach I work with um, has said, you know, here's macronutrition and macronutrition is based off of a formula with your, with your body weight, you know, and what your goals are, if you're trying to increase muscle mass or you're trying to, you know, do body recomp or, or get fat loss, I use the formula and basically what I eat is 52 grams of fat, 185 grams of carb and 240 grams of protein. And then there's a little bit of variance in there depending on what I'm doing from a training standpoint. Like mm-hmm. if it's a long day and I'm doing, cause I'm training for this hundred mile race, right? If I'm doing like a seven hour training session that day, I'm obviously going to add on more probably around 300 calories an hour based off of what I'm trying to train, but I'm trying to get leaner because when you're going that long, you know, I'm trying to, to just be as light as I can without losing a ton of muscle. Right. So Brian said to me in the, in a few text messages and the schedule, so he's going to go, we're going to, I'll do your podcast and at this time to this time, (laughs) and then we can just go for a quick 14 mile run. Just one mile, 14 times. 14 mile. I was like, did I read that correctly? Like five miles. Okay. I get six miles. With your buddy Eric, he made me run eleven miles. Yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. that he was nuts, and then yeah. you come with fourteen. That's like, that's like, we're basically at like almost more than a half a marathon. That's like a two and a half hour run, just for shits and giggles, basically. Yeah, so, well, it's, it's it's because it's part of the process. But also, you said that, and because you're training, you already did three hours of what biking today. This morning it was a bike weights and just kind of movement, like a yoga type of stretch deal. 
Oh, okay. So, and then as you're waiting to come on the podcast, you did a hundred dips and a uh, hundred uh, push-ups in your kitchen. Yeah, I was waiting because yeah. as I looked and I saw your book, no gym required. Yeah, you got the name I got, not right because I said it. Well, I was gonna get. I, I got inspired. Okay, thank you. And when you. inspiration hits, sometimes you have to take massive action, right? <laughs> because the time is always now. So I, I got I got inspired to take it because I wanted I wanted I wanted to be sexy. Everybody wants to be sexy and strong is the new sexy. <laughs> I love it. So basically, also, you just don't like to waste any time. Like you're no. saying, I'm sitting here waiting, like, like you know, for the next three minutes. I might as well, have, like, you know, crank out another 100 squats yeah. and 100 push-ups and 100 pull-ups. And- yeah, and, and time is life, right? And the one, yes. thing, the one thing we're not getting more of, time. you can get more money, you can get more friends, you can get more fame, you can't get more time. Absolutely. So if you don't value your, like, that's the thing that is like, I don't understand why not everybody schedules their day like that. Yeah. You know, and, and doesn't, and, and it's hard with kids. What do you do? What do you do? If you have kids. How can you schedule a day like that? Like, you know, it's all great and fine in, th- yeah, in yeah. theory and even in practicality to some, to some extent. And I'm a believer, obviously mm-hmm. I'm doing your program mm-hmm. and these are all the same. We, we, we share the same philosophies, but shit gets in the way. Sure. Like kids, sure. like family, sure. like whatever else. Mm-hmm. How do you schedule your day so regimentally for the average Joe to get that? Sure. In line. So you start you start with structure, and then what what trumps structure mm-hmm. is your ability to compensate and adjust. You can't you can't be the perfectionist that has to live in this box and I have to do this at that time and I have to that then become neurotic, right? And then right. life's not really fun because you're living off of a schedule. Right. But you have the schedule to keep you productive. Right. I get that. And then you compensate and right. adjust. You based modify. Off, yeah, based off of what life is gonna throw you. And life is gonna throw you a whole heck of a lot on a daily basis. But don't go into a day without a plan, because what if life doesn't throw you any curveballs that day? Then right. you're non-productive. Absolutely. And if you're non-productive, and you're not, you're not giving your best to the world, what are you doing? You're not living. You're just existing. I agree with you. Who, who would you say you look up to, and what's your favorite book? My favorite book was Heads Up Baseball by Ken Revisa. That book, that one day I picked it up, that book changed my life completely. 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 I'm an example of how one day, one book, one person can completely change the trajectory of your life. Okay, so the one day was that guy? The, the, one, the one day was July 4th, 2000, walking into Barnes & Noble. The one book was Heads Up Baseball. The one guy was my mentor, Dr. Ken Revisa. Yeah, Ken Revisa, right. Yeah. What was it, and why that book? It just spoke to me. Probably the right book at the right time. What message was in that book, though? Control what you can control. The rest is bullshit. Control. So that was the one statement that made a difference. Control what you can control. Yeah. I, I asked people the million dollar question and I'd like to flip this podcast around now, Jen, and ask you the million dollar question, which the million dollar question is this. What do you know now that you would go, you wish you knew then, right? And you can fill in the blank for then. That so was like, my rapid fire question for you. Perfect. Well, I'll answer it for you. Cause for me, it's control what you can control and the rest is bullshit. Because if you can't control it, don't give it any time. Because it's a waste of time. If you can influence it, focus on what you need to do to influence it, which is usually something that you can control. I'm actually learning that that message and that philosophy right now because the older I get and the more seasoned I get, I'm learning that I put too much energy into things that I cannot control. Yep. And I work myself up and I get so much anxiety and I get angry and frustrated. And like at the end of the day, there's nothing I can do with things that I can't do anything about. Wasted time and energy. Wasted time and energy. And, you know, only to control the things you can. And sometimes it's a, you know, I think that you, you were, it's a very, it's easy to kind of, not relax is the wrong word, but it's, it's, your head becomes in a better place once you kind of acknowledge that is the case and that is the truth. But I'm not there yet. I have to be honest with you. Sure. But like, it is a work in progress, but I am learning that message more and more and more. Yeah. Well, when you're superwoman, sometimes you think you can control things you can't control and you can influence everything, you know? Right. Superwoman. That's <laughs> which, right. That's which me. is a strength, right? Yeah. But the, the, the understanding of what I can control, what I can't control, what I can influence. And that's probably the number one mental game skill, mental performance skill that when you talk to athletes, whether it be George or other people that have gone through this program, they'll, they'll often come back and go, it helped me get clarity on what I could control and what I couldn't control. And when I gave up the things I couldn't control and chose to invest my time, energy, and focus on the things I could control, I started to see changes. And when they saw those changes, it, then it becomes a cycle. I see the effort I'm putting in. I'm getting a better result. I, I get excited. Mm-hmm. I want to put more effort in. I get more result. I get more excitement. And I start going in that direction. 
like our you know our mutual friend Eric Burns would say that the pivotal. I hope he listens to this episode. We've spoken the, to him about. He'll it. listen to it on a run somewhere, probably in the deep desert of Arizona. But on the on the pivotal <laughs> point of his career, he said the t- turning point of his career was sitting down with a mental performance coach at a breakfast. The mental performance coach had known him from their relationship previously. He called him and said, "Eric, you're not performing the way you want to. You're not performing at the level you're capable of. Let's get together." And he literally took out a napkin. And he wrote down on one side the things you could control, on the other side the things he couldn't control. Eric said that day changed his career. He said he would have been out of baseball if he didn't have that napkin. Eric Burns is what was a major league baseball yeah, player. Ten year plus major league baseball player, you know, and, and uh, working for the major league baseball network right now, just an, an icon of a, of, a, of an athlete. He went from a baseball sport, which is a you know power a long run in baseball would be 180 feet from home to second base, and now he's literally doing a triathlon across the country last, you know, in the summer of 2018 where he swam from San Francisco to Oakland, rode his bike from Oakland to Chicago and ran from Chicago to New York. No, he's, he, he's, he's superhuman. Yeah. And he's now an ultra marathoner, Ironman. Like I is like a machine beyond machine. So that's exactly right. So that's, so he had the same message, basically the same thing that you had the control, you control yep. what you can control. Yep. And that, and, and, and a lot of, you know, and Eric was a baseball player and, and I, that was my background and, I think a lot of times in that sport, there's so many things you cannot control right. that once you accept, I can't control it, let me choose to go here, man, stress disappears. Stress minimizes, I should say. Never I would say it never disappears. Never disappears. It minimizes. It yeah, minimizes. It minimizes. And, and you become more productive and you have more fun playing the game because you're focused on things that actually you can influence. Wow. That's cool. I like but it's the sense. same way in life. It's the same way in life. Is that where does the most of the stress come from people in life? From focusing on things they cannot control. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That's what like that's my big work of the, uh, that's my big work is because my I, my cortisol I can feel my cortisol levels like raising with mm-hmm. all this shit that I cannot control, and it becomes like a, a vicious spiral of of like stress and anxiety yep. when. You know, it's like unnecessary because there's nothing you can do at the end of the day anyway, right? That's it. I so mean, I mean. I agree with you. But that's it, a good. That's a good message, though. That's yeah, a good. That's it, a. That's it's, a good it's one. probably the most important. Me- I mean, if you're asking me the million simple. dollar question, what yeah. do I know now? I wish I knew then. It would be control what you can control, let go of the rest, yeah. right? And and I think this ties along with what we're talking about is that a lot of times when people feel like anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. They're not clinically diagnosed with anxiety, but everyone will say, "Oh man, I get anxious about certain yes. things, speaking or whatever." Right? Is anxiety comes from obsessing about what's going to happen in the future. Depression, oh, I should have done this, woulda, coulda, Mm -hmm. comes from obsessing about what happened in the past. Optimal performance comes from obsessing about what you're doing right here, right now, in the moment, being where your feet are. And when you have that type of focus, where your feet are continually, that's living life at a high level, man. You're making the big time where you are, you know? So I think if there's a message that can quickly, positively impact the lives of the people that are listening to this, it's let go of the past because it's going to pull you down. Let go of the future because it's going to make you anxious and wear you out. And just dial in on what you're doing right here, right now. And if you don't know what to do, take out a piece of paper or take out your phone, open up a Google Doc, and look at the rest of the time you have today and make a schedule. And if you don't know what to do with your schedule, just take what time you want to go to sleep and start there. And if you want to go to sleep at 10 o'clock tonight and it's 5 o'clock right now, write down 5 to 10. Free time, 10, sleep. Start there because it's the start that stops most people. Exactly true. It's the start that stops most people. And they got to get momentum oh. on their side, right? They got to get it. They got to get it started. I Once agree. they get it started and they and they're in it, all of a sudden now it's like it's like that merry-go-round, right? When you're, when, I don't even know if they have merry-go-rounds right now because it's probably there's probably too much liability for the city <laughs> that has the merry-go-round, right? But if you're on a merry-go-round and and you and you have to work really hard to get it going. But once you get it going, you can just flip it with a finger. Right. Well, life's, I think life is all about momentum. Everything's momentum, dri- momentum driven, right? So hmm. that's why I think that was, that's so true. Like the start is always the most difficult thing to get in any program or anything in life. Right. But once you start, you have the momentum. It's very easy to stay on track then or stay on path. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and you generate your own momentum. And you generate your own momentum. You make momentum with your mindset, man. You make momentum with what you do on a daily basis. Don't be waiting for someone else. Don't be waiting for the moon and the stars to align to go, Ooh, now I'm ready. I have momentum. No, get started. Right. And then what do you say? How do they, how do they get started when that's the hardest thing? Start small. With that little schedule. Yeah. Start, start with, with, with writing down one today's thing. date 
what time it is now and what time you're going to go to bed and write down free time. And you don't anybody know can do that. Anyone can do that. Yeah, right now. And then once they do that, you build. Once they do that, then they'll probably go, oh, well, I wrote down what time I'm going to go to bed tonight. What do you think's next? What time am I going to wake up tomorrow? What am I going to do when I wake up? Here comes my morning <laughs> routine, right? And the morning routine gets started. And then all of a sudden, you get a little bit of momentum on your side, and that starts creeping into your day. And next thing you know, you put together a quality day. And if you have a quality morning, that leads to a quality day. Quality day leads to a quality week. Quality week leads to a quality month, quality quarter, quality year, quality life. Get started in the morning. Wow. Well, with that, I want to leave because that's a really good, that's a good point. I don't want to, that's a good one. That's a good way to end. So tell people, Brian, if they want more little nuggets of, yep. of info from you, which I think you're, you have a ton of, where sure. would people find you? Probably go to strong as the new sexy.com. No, <laughs> if they go to, if they go to briancane.com, B-R-I-A-N-C-A-I-N. Okay. B-R-I-A-N-C-A-I-N.com. Okay. Uh, on Instagram, Twitter, Brian Kane peak, P-E-A-K. But the, the people that are, that are listening to this, that are, that are personal trainers, that are coaches, that are parents, if they're looking for a, the, the 10 pillars and the skill sets to develop in people that are looking to them for mentorship, or if you're working with clients, athletes, corporate people, whatever it is, then the mental performance mastery certification would be the place to go because then you're going to get the exact how to and when to mm-hmm. of building those 10 pillars in that mental performance. And I'm doing mindset. it right now, guys. And it is great. I actually am really enjoying it and I'm learning a lot and it's, it dovetails beautifully with any kind of goal you're trying to achieve in life. So mm. I, I highly recommend it. And, um, that's why I'm so thrilled, like just like genuinely thrilled that you're here. Oh, it's been fun. I've enjoyed it. It's been, I don't know how long that was, but it went I by have no idea. that fast. How long has it been? I always usually ask that anyway, but one hour, 11 minutes. One oh, hour, 11 minutes. Okay. Oh, that's a long one. It's one minute, 71 times. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. It's like this run we're about to go do. It's one mile. <laughs> exactly. 14 times. Uh-oh. Everyone just, you know, pray for me. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you. It's been fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.